Welcome to the Transformation Church Podcast, where we're leading people into a transforming relationship with Jesus. We hope this message inspires you, builds your faith, and gives you a fresh perspective on God and His Word so you can see transformation in your own life. Enjoy the message. My name is Andrea Kramer. My husband and I have the privilege of serving here um, with you guys and for you and just seeking the face of God for you. For those of you that have been here for a couple months now and wondering if he was married, yes, he is. I've been back in kids. Um, I do have an amazing report for you, though. Since Easter, our kids' ministry has doubled in size, <laughs> which means we need y'all's help. <laughs> Um, I do want to thank those of you that have been serving in our, our nursery and our kids and our preschool area. Listen, we could not do this without you. And I'm so very thankful that we're getting onto a schedule where people that are called to serve in children's also have a moment to sit and just receive themselves. And so... Um, But if you are interested in working in our kids' area, listen, even if you're not a teacher and you just want to be crowd control, um, I can find a job for you. So that's a little plug, and now we'll talk about the Word of God. Listen, we're in week two of our series, Spirit and Life. And I told Ryan yesterday that I was so excited to speak on this topic this morning that we're going to share Uh, it reignited a passion and a fire inside of me that I think had kind of gone away for a little while. And um, just restudying for this um, topic has just opened my eyes and just really made me fall in love with the Word of God and apologetics again. Yes, I said I fell in love with apologetics. Um, I'm going to nerd out on you guys a little bit today because this is something that's super exciting for us as believers as we dive into the Word of God and we prove the truth of the Word of God. So this morning, our message is entitled, Proven. Let's pray together our congregational prayer. Father, as I open your word today, speak to me. May I have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and the courage to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been doing uh, that prayer for a couple months. Can I ask you, you know, I've been back in kids. So can I ask you guys to do that one more time, nice and loud, and let's use our big outside voices. So let's say it again. Father, as I speak to me, may I have a heart to receive and the courage to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. You guys all get candy at the end of service today. You did so good. Our verse for this series um, is John chapter 6, verse 36. And it says, the spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words, and this is Jesus speaking, the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Understanding the importance of the word of God as a believer is so vital to us, especially in this time, in this culture, and in this era. You know, it says in the book of Revelation that there be wars and rumors of wars. There will be all of these things that will be happening, and we're living in those last days. And so it's important for us as believers to come around the word of God and really, and, and you know, listen, the enemy is great at getting us to argue about things and, and be divided about things. And the word of God is very unifying. So if we can come around the word of God, the word of spirit and life. And like the apostles and the disciples that went up into the upper room and were in one accord, the spirit of God can pour out on us. And so the importance for us as followers of Christ to know the word of God and know the authenticity and the um, inerrancy of the word of God is so important for us to have a defense for our faith. 
For when people come to us and just say, it's just a good book with good principles. This morning, we are going to dive into um, a topic that really can help us when we walk outside of these doors to say, this is real, this is true, it's been proven, and this is why. Listen, For those of you, and I I was praying, as I was praying over this, I was saying, Lord, for those of us that are followers of Christ, give us a passion and a fire for your word again to have a defense for our faith. And for those of you that are in this room or even watching online, that you have, have yet to come to believe in the word of God and what it says, this is my prayer for you today, that the things that you've been taught that have told you that this is not a scientific book and it can't be proven, that this morning you can hear the truth of what God's word really is. And so that's my prayer for you today. So this morning we're gonna go through seven reasons why the Bible can be proven or can be trusted. And um, I know seven sounds like a lot, but listen, we're, we're gonna go through these pretty quickly. I want to tell you a little bit of a story about the reason why this kind of, um, I got super interested and exciting. It reignited a passion in my heart that started when I was a senior in high school. So my family and I, we lived in Clearwater. Uh, We moved there when I was um, a sophomore in high school, and I went to a school in St. Petersburg, so I drove a little bit of ways to St. Pete to go to a Moody Bible school in St. Pete. And so, um, does anybody familiar with Moody Bible up in, up in Chicago? Yep. And so, um, so it, it was affiliated with Moody Bible Institute. And so we had a Bible class. And Mr. Strickland was my Bible teacher. So my junior year and my senior year, Mr. Strickland was my Bible teacher. Now, he followed after his name. He was strict. He uh, taught a a Bible class at his church for years. He was a pastor and then retired and then became the Bible teacher at this school. When I say he was strict, he was not mean. He was just strict. And this is the reason why he told us that his kids, they could only watch one minute of TV per one minute of book that they read. So when they came home, however much time they spent in front of a book is how much time they got to spend in front of a TV. I tried that. Listen, (laughs) it didn't work for me, but maybe you as parents can try that. But he was, he was very much, he was an academic and he loved the word of God. Our senior year, He took us through the book of Romans, was our book for the year. It took him an entire nine months to get us through the book of Romans. But he also took us through another book by Josh McDowell called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. This book was life-changing for me. See, Josh McDowell went to law school. And he he wasn't an atheist, but he didn't believe in the word of God. He found himself at a Bible study and he decided from this interaction, one interaction with these kids from a Bible study, he's 82 now, that he was going to disprove that the Bible was real. So as any college student would do, he told his parents, I'm going to go travel around the United States and Europe and prove that the Bible's not real. Could you imagine that conversation if your college, your, your college student came to you and said, listen, I'm just going to tour around Europe, and I'm just going to see if the Bible is authentic or not. But that's what he did. At the end of his study, he came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And with this came a doctoral thesis that is called now Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It's not an easy read, but it's a great read. And these seven principles that I'm going to be pulling out to you today come from that book. And it's important for us to know and to understand that the word of God has been tested and it is true. And so the first thing is this, is the seven reasons why the Bible can be trusted or be proven is this first one is it's historically accurate. 
The statement drives people crazy that believe that the Bible is just full of good principles. And they say, oh, but the Noah thing didn't happen and this thing didn't happen. But in Psalm 33, verse four, it says this, for the word of the Lord is right and true. And how do we know that the word of the Lord is right and true? And so historically, books of ancient texts were put through, these are all, even the Greek, um, the Iliad was put through this to know that it was authentic. It went through three testings. So the first one is the bibliographical test. I'm, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to nerd out on you just a little bit because this is super exciting. So the first one is that, did you know that there are over 24,000 co original copies of the New Testament? Over 24,000. The next book in line to that is Homer's The Iliad, and it has 643. So think about that. 20, at least, and they're finding more. 24,000 copies of the original New Testament manuscript. It has been tested. What they do is they... they they test the reliability of this. So it's not just one copy of one letter that went to one church. It is 27,000 copies of one letter that went to one church. The next test that it went through was the internal evidence test. It focuses on the authors and can they be qualified? Did they really exist? So historians, so they went through this, they went through the manuscripts, they, they checked out the people, could they find their lineage? Were these real people that wrote this? And then the third was the external evidence test. And this is looking at, it, at other documents, is it accurate? So they held one copy to another copy, yep, that's exact, and they went to, from one copy to another. Understanding that the only other book that's even in comparison to this is Homer's the Iliad, and it only has 643 copies. Listen, friends, the Bible is true and authentic. It has been tested. It is real. The second test that it went through is it is, it is scientifically accurate. So I love this one, too. So you know how they used to believe that the earth was flat? Okay. Well, we're going to find that it says in Isaiah 40, verse 22, God sits above the circle of the earth. That word in the Hebrew language actually means sphere. So when we were all, not us, because we, we figured it out before that, but when they were all arguing that the, that the earth was flat, all they had to do was read in Isaiah where it says it is a sphere. Remember the, 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 the belief scientifically of can the Bible, the earth, is it held up? Like what's holding it up? How is it sustained? The Greeks believed it was held up by Atlas. Remember the big guy with the, with the earth on his shoulder, you know? Uh, the Hindus believed that, okay, this is great. The Hindus believed that it was, uh, that the earth sat on the back of an elephant, which stood on the back of a sea turtle, which stood on the back of a serpent that swam in the, in the ocean. The Egyptians, who were masterminds at, at building, they were brilliant, believed that it stood on five pillars. But Job, which is the oldest book, so Job is the old, it, it was written before Genesis. It's just not in that order. So Job is the oldest book that we can find in the Bible. God, it says this in Job 26, 7, God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. How did Job know that? He was inspired by God. These scientific, and, and there's so many more, you know, there's, a, 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 there's literally a day missing when Hezekiah uh, prayed that God would, the sun would stand still. There's literally a time and space missing Scientists can go back and they can, they can pinpoint that that actual moment is missing in our timeline. This word of God, for those of you that don't believe that the word of God is scientific, this is what proves the scientists. The scientists don't prove this. Because how many of you know that sometimes the scientists get it a little wrong? 
Pluto is a planet. No, it isn't a planet. There's a couple stars. No, there's billions. The third thing is this. The Bible is prophetically accurate. Jesus has accomplished over 300 messianic prophecies from the Old Testament. In fact, from Palm Sunday to what we celebrate as Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, in that one week, he accomplished over 27 messianic prophecies that were prophesied in the Old Testament. So think about that. Jesus, in one week, completed or accomplished 27 prophecies just in that one week, in total over 300. Here's the probability of this. In in 1958, a man by the name of Dr. Peter Stoner wrote this. He was a mathematician. He was an astronomer. And he said this. He concluded this, that the probability of Jesus just fulfilling eight prophecies, just eight, is one in 10 to the 17th power. So that's 10 with 17 zeros after it. For Jesus to have accomplished eight of these messianic prophecies, he accomplished over 300. The ones that are left, we will see one day. Listen, it's important for us to have a defense for our faith in these last days. Not so we can say, look how smart we are, but that when people come to us and they have been told and lied to that this is not real and Jesus was just a good man, we can tell them, listen, I appreciate what you're telling me, but mathematically, that's impossible. That Jesus has accomplished something. The Lord laid it out for us to see that he is real. There is no way that a man, a baby born in Bethlehem could have accomplished and done everything that Jesus has done that was prophesied about him a thousand years before he stepped on this earth. Second Peter 1, 20 says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. These prophets that wrote this were inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was not their words. It was not Job's words that said, the earth is hanging on nothing. That was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Listen, friends, the reason why this is important is because there is an attack on the word of God in our day and age. And we're going to get to that about how it's accomplished. It is fought through so many attacks. But don't check out on me today. If anything, lean in a little bit. Because maybe this week, and this is my prayer, my prayer has been this week, we will, we will come across somebody that does not believe in the word of God and we can share them the truth in love, that it is real and it is accounted for. The fourth one is this. It is thematically unified. So it would be easy to do this. So this whole book from Genesis to Revelation, there is one theme through the whole thing. Genesis talks about Jesus with Adam and Eve in the garden. And the book of Revelation is a revelation not of the end times, but of our Lord and Savior Jesus. That's what it says. And so from Genesis through Revelation, the theme is Jesus. God the Father loved us so much that he gave his only son. And the reason why this is important to know that the theme is unified of the Bible is because it was written over 1,600 years by 40 different people. That's what this tells me. Listen, have you guys ever done like a term paper? 
if you sitting by yourself trying to write something, sometimes your thoughts don't go from one to, you know, A to Z, from one to 10. That you're all over the place, you know, the whole thing of like squirrel, where you're sitting there and all of a sudden like, oh, what was that? Over 1,600 years and 40 different authors. And the theme is the same. That tells us that the word of God is true. The fifth one is this. It is trusted by Jesus. You know, every once in a while, I'll be talking with somebody and they'll say something like, I love Jesus, but I have a hard time believing everything that's in the Bible. The problem with that is if we don't love Jesus, if we don't love his word, we don't love him. You know, I, I had the privilege of being a worship pastor for over 20 years. I love worship. I do. I, I absolutely love it. And I, I am so beyond grateful that we have a worship pastor here that loves to bring us into the presence of the Lord. Listen, we are blessed to have Pastor Mike and Christina here to usher us into the presence of the Lord. And I have to say, over 20 years of, of leading in worship, this has always been the most important thing in my life. Yeah. Jesus' words, and he told us in John chapter 6, give us spirit and life. When we look at this and we're like, ah, I love Jesus. But mm, there's a couple things in here I don't really like. Well, that's okay. You don't have to like them. They're still true. <laughs> and Jesus trusted the word of God. He trusted the Old Testament. We don't get to, to pick and, uh, which things we want and what we don't want. Matthew chapter 5 says this, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's love, law, will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Jesus gave us a promise. Listen, Jesus gave us a promise that this word would be completed until its purpose is achieved. It will be true and honest. Every detail will be apparent until its purpose is achieved. Hear my heart this morning. When we believe only the things that we like in the Bible and not the things that we don't like, well, I believe that in the Bible, but I'm not, I don't believe that. Then it's not the Bible that we trust, it's ourselves. And then that means, friends, that we serve a very, very small God. Because I'm a small human. I, I you know, I, I, I do believe, listen, I'm an encourager. I want people to accomplish the things of God that they have in their lives. May your purposes be found. But I know that we are sinners saved by grace. Our humanity is very, very flawed. Left to my own devices, friends, I can get into a lot of trouble. I don't get to pick and choose the things of the Bible that I'm going to believe and that I don't because then I trust me, not his word. Just because our culture says it's full of old stuff that isn't applicable for today doesn't mean we get to change it to fit our lifestyle. No, we don't change the Bible to fit us. We change us to fit the Bible. Jesus trusted the word of God. Number six, it has survived all attacks. There has been no book in history, please listen to me, there has been no book in history that has been attacked more than the authenticity of the word of God. So, 
So that should turn a light bulb on to us, right? So as we're going through this, we know it's been historically tested. It's been, it's been scientifically affirmed. It's, I mean, it has been scientifically affirmed. It's been, you know, it's been prophetically affirmed, like the prophecies, Jesus. But yet it's been attacked consistently. And we have to ask ourselves, why is it being attacked? There is a ruler of this world. And he don't like this book. In fact, in John 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. But in Genesis, it talks about how that word crushed its head. The enemy is attacking the word of God, and it is not our job to beat people over the head with the word of God. It is our job to love people into the family of God, and then his word changes them. Because I don't know about you, but before, you know, well, I got saved when I was five, but, you know, everybody has their, their moment. Everybody has their season. And when I came back to the Lord, my uh, junior year of college, I had taken a year off and I, and I just I poured myself into the word of God. I, I had, listen, I had decided that I had done everything right because I was the pastor's kid and the church girl and I had, I had done, and it, it wasn't working for me the way I thought it should. So I tried it on my own. Y'all, it didn't take me long. <laughs> To come back to be like, oh, yeah, no, this is the right way to do it. This is the right way to go. But all of these attacks that has been coming toward the word of God, it really is to pull us away from the truth of God's word and what it does in our lives. First Peter verse 1, verse uh, 24 and 25, it says, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. There was a French philosopher named Voltaire. So he uh, lived in the 1700s, and friends, he hated Christians. He was a French philosopher and he hated Christians. And this is what he said in 1764. He said this about the Bible. He said, that is what fools have written, what imbeciles commend, what rogues teach and young children are made to learn by heart. And he said, he wrote this. He said, he believed that we are living in the twilight of Christianity, which means it's going away. And that was in 1764. That we were living in the twilight. If you follow Voltaire, um, don't listen. I mean, yes, listen to this next part. Because this is what he said in 1764. He said, within 100 years, the Bible will be forgotten. The funny part about this is that when Voltaire passed away, guess who bought his house? A bunch of Christians. And they opened up the French Bible Society in his home. And they used his printing press for nothing less than to print the word of God and distribute it in France. We are not living in the twilight of Christianity, my friend. We are living in the greatest moment of history where we can share with others the truth and the authority and the love of the word of God and our Savior, Jesus. The last point is this. The word of God has transforming power. See, I love all of these other analytical and educational tests that the word of God, I love it. I, I literally nerd out on it. I love it. I love the fact that it can, it can be proven. But more importantly, the word of God transforms our lives. This right here is alive. 
It's one of the points that no person can disprove or discount. My husband's story is an, is an incredible story. We've told you for years, Ryan and I believe in, in, in going to therapy and to going to counselors, finding a good Christian counselor. I mean, I'm telling you, it, it is life-changing. The first five years of our, our marriage, listen, I believe in premarital counseling. I believe even more in postmarital counseling. And I would sit and listen to the counselors talk to my husband and he would begin to tell his story. He'd be, they would st stop him. You're a miracle. You are a walking miracle. See, the reason why I know this word has transforming power is because I saw my husband before. I saw him BC and then I saw him AD. I saw a young man that was so full of anger and so full of hurt that was closed off and had walls up, didn't let anybody in. I saw him come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I saw him open up the word of God. And even though his, he grew up in a home uh, of drug addicts and alcoholics where his mom was a prostitute and he was given to, to different family members to raise because his parents were in and out of rehab. I saw a man at 20 years old give his heart heart to the Lord and never look back and I see my children I see my family tree my children's lives are different because my husband made a decision when he was 20 years old that he would allow the transforming power of the word of God to change him Listen, if you don't believe any of the other tests, believe this, that once I was blind and now I see. <laughs> Friends, the word of God, if we follow after it, if we walk according to its principles, not its rules, but if we hold on to the principles of the word of God, our lives will be beautiful. They won't be perfect because we're not perfect. We get in the way. Listen, one day it'll all be perfect. One day it'll all be wonderful. But until that day, I'm going to stand on the transforming power of the word of God. John 8, 31 says this, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Friends, don't call yourself a follower of Christ unless you hold to his teachings. Then, once we hold to his teachings, when we don't respond the way we want to respond, when we actually forgive when we're hurt, when Jesus told us to forgive, when we walk in love one with another, when we walk in purity and righteousness, when we hold to the teachings of Jesus, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Friends, this morning, the importance of the word of God to know that it is real. If you, if you want to dive deeper into this, look up the book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. But open this. If you don't know what version you should read, listen, the New Living Translation is, is, a, is an easy everyday read. The New American Standard and the ESV are wonderful for study. For Greek, for the Greek and Hebrew translations, it's great. But pick this up. Begin to read. Start with the book of, if you need something light, start with the book of Philippians. Paul just tells them how great they are and you're wonderful. And you're, if that's what you need, go there. If you need an attitude check, then open up the book of James. Listen, every time the Lord brings me to James, I'm like, no, I'm so sorry. I won't do it again. I don't want to read James again. 
you will know the truth. And friend, hear my heart. This truth will set you free. It will set you free. Can we stand together this morning? They're going to worship the Lord and we're, we're not done yet. So don't everybody go out. We got a couple more things we got to do, but I want you to do this. Before we go into the song of worship, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if there are any of you that are in this place today that you have been doubting the truth of who Jesus is, you've held him at a distance that he's just a good person. Friend, this moment is for you. This morning, if you, if you need to come back to the truth of God's word, no one's looking around. I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand this morning. If you need to come back to the truth of who Jesus is, just lift your hand today. Yes, anyone else? Yes, anyone else? Church family, can we pray for those that have just lifted their hands? And I'm going to pray over you. Instead of us saying it all together out, I'm going to pray this over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray an impartation right now over those that lifted their hands for a passion and a desire for the word of God that they will become hungry once again for your principles and your truth. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak to them through your word, that it'll be easy to understand and that they would have the courage and the boldness to walk out the words that you have said. Now, Father, for each and every one of us, I ask in the name of Jesus, that you would allow the truth to resound in our hearts and that that truth would set us free. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's message, be sure to share it with your friends and tag us at TransformTLH. Thanks again for listening and we look forward to seeing your face in the place someday. Have a great week.